morning, everybody, and welcome to Cardiology Grand Rounds. Uh, it's good to see so many people up and rallied and enjoying, I hope, their coffee. Um, I am really pleased to be able to introduce Fenley Stewart, who is a professor, a, a clinical professor of cardiology, and I think the clinical part is incredibly important, as I'll get to. Um, Fenley is a, um, actually was born in Alabama, which I didn't know, um, and does not carry with him the accent um, characteristic of the region, but is, uh, went to undergrad and medical school uh, at Stanford and then um, did his residency in Boston and then came to Seattle for his cardiology fellowship where he has been ever since. And his time has been at Harborview and the University of Washington with the exception of a few years where he got the experience of private practice uh, with, with Peace Health down in Longview. And I thought as I was a fellow starting that um, one of the things that really stood out about Fenley is that he was something of an anomaly at Montlake anyway, of being truly a general cardiologist. Um, he had an experience of having been in private practice and he had a focus on general cardiology. And in particular, he's always been the cardiologist that I'll send patients to where I really feel like a, a focus on if you will, lifestyle modifications is something that is going to be really valuable to them. Because as long as um, I've been at the U, um, Fenley has been somebody who's really focused his patient care on helping patients help themselves through lifestyle modifications, whether it be exercise or diet um, or any of the other things, weight loss that patients can do. And, and when I've talked to his patients, they've really appreciated that particular approach. Um, and in chatting with him a little bit, some of that comes from the, um, his own belief system around uh, the power of that and, and, and his own family history. Um, but some of it's just that good practical aspect of there are things we could all be doing to improve our overall health and well-being that don't have to specifically involve medications and the like. And towards that end, um, Benley has also been uh, in, integrated and then was running our um, now it's got a different name, but the medical school course of cardiovascular disease in human biology um, for us for years and continues to do so and was one of the focal points of exactly the lifestyle modification for coronary artery disease um, education for our med students. So he's going to bring some of that to us today, thankfully, here during the pandemic, where in theory we may or may not have more time to exercise and more time to encourage our patients to exercise and talk with us about the value of exercise, what exactly the dose responses should be, and how to integrate that in our clinical practices. So thanks much, Fenley, and please educate on how we can get ourselves out there and get our patients out there. All right, thank you, Karen. I only have one disclosure. I am an exercise addict, so something I've been doing my whole life. <clears throat> I also want to disclose I am fully clothed at home drinking coffee. Uh, this is a slide my chiropractor, a cartoon my chiropractor sent to me last night. Uh, to prevent a heart attack, take one aspirin every day, take it for a run, take it to the gym, and then take it for a bike ride. So hopefully by the end of this talk, I will convince you that there is nothing, uh, there's no medication that can improve mortality like exercise. So the outline, we're gonna go through the US guidelines published in 2018. We're gonna talk a little bit about mortality benefits with moderate and vigorous exercise, as well as later in the talk, light exercise based on a new studies using accelerometers. We're gonna review the data showing that uh, TV watching time and sedentary time may attenuate the benefits of exercise. So something that our patients have to consider. I have my own belief system is that vigorous exercise is better than just moderate exercise. I have some data to support that and there's some data that does not support that. I started this preparing for this talk thinking I was going to talk about interval training and in fact high intensity interval training but unfortunately there is no data on high intensity interval training and mortality, so I did not go there for this talk, but that's something to think about down the road for Grand Rounds, okay. And then I'm gonna review some newer studies that were published since the guidelines. Uh, the PURE trial, which looked at activity levels in low and middle income countries, 
which is new, and then also data using accelerometers, which theoretically give us a better idea of how active the subjects are. Uh, we're gonna look at strength training, although I could not find much mortality data on strength training, but I wanna at least bring it up because it's something that's being recommended by the guidelines. And then we're gonna talk about integrating physical activity counseling into your practice. So the most recent guidelines published in 2018, this is from Health and Human Services, and this is right out of their Guidelines for America in second edition. I just wanna look at a couple of things that maybe would help us convince our patients to exercise more for those people who are inactive. And that's about half of individuals around the world are, are inactive, they don't exercise. Uh, it's getting a little bit better now in the United States. So uh, lowering the risk of type two diabetes, I always bring that up with patients, particularly if they have a family history. Uh, reduce uh, risk of eight types of cancer now, and you can see the new ones flagged here with a star in the new guidelines, endometrial cancer, esophageal cancer, stomach, bladder. A breast colon uh, have been known for a while now. Uh, reducing risk of dementia. So a lot of the, our older patients are worried about this. And so exercise can improve their cognition. Anxiety, that's something that I've, I've seen in my own lifestyle. I have getting anxious at times when I get overloaded with work. And I think exercise is very important for that. And particularly right now, I hope all of you are still exercising because the COVID virus and the other things happening in, in our society can produce some anxiety. Uh, depression, reduced risk of depression, including postpartum depression. And then strength training here on the bottom, of course weight, I should say also helping people maintain their weight is very important. And then for strength training, improving bone health, physical function, lowering risk of falls and fall related injuries in our older patients and our frail patients. And at the end of this talk, I'm, I have put together with my trainer an exercise program for our patients. I don't have it in a, I don't have it put together in a way that I can show it during this talk, but I'll give you a little inkling of what it looks like at the end. Okay, so key guidelines to note would be to tell patients not to sit as much as they have in the past. So any amount of activity has benefits and we'll, show, we'll look at that data. In fact, the biggest bang for the buck is taking the inactive patient and making them more active. So the current guidelines for moderate intensity exercise would be two and a half to five hours a week. For vigorous activity, that would be 75 minutes to two and a half hours a week or some combination of those. And ideally would be spread throughout the week and I, this isn't truly defined, but we're gonna look at that in one particular paper that looked at looked at subjects who exercise once or twice a week versus three or more times per week. Okay, so you can do more and some of you do. I know some people bike for hours and hours and hours. I have one patient I think who, who does triathlons and I think he spends 10 to 12 hours a week exercising. There is benefit by doing more, although the benefit is relatively small. And then here's the recommendation for strength training to do two days or more of strength training during the week. Okay. And then for older patients, getting them to do, quote, multi-component physical activity that includes balance training as well as aerobic and muscle strengthening activities. And that's something that my trainer and I focused on and he put together a program for, for patients who are healthy under 60, healthy over 60 and frail. So just some definitions, moderate activity is about three to six METs. Remember one MET is the amount of energy we spend sitting in a chair or resting. And so three to six METs would be uh, moderate activity and vigorous activity would be six or more. I often use with my patients this talk test and I, if you don't use it, I would highly recommend it. It's just, a, I tell my patients for moderate intensity activity, they can speak, uh, they could speak in full sentences, but they're working. They might have a light sweat. And then for the vigorous intensity activity, you really can't speak in full sentences. Uh, you, have to, you have to speak haltingly if you're doing vigorous exercise. 
Okay. And then for looking at these clinical trials, I made this table to help us a little bit. So if you're doing three to four METs of activity for two and a half hours a week, you do about 450 to 600 MET minutes per week or seven and a half to 10 MET hours. So when we look at MET hours on these uh, tables and on the figures, we're, for the guidelines you're talking about, somewhere between seven and a half and 20 MET hours per week if you're doing the lowest and the, uh, the up lower and upper bounds of the recommended activities. So about seven and a half to 20 met hours per week. So let's look at uh, how we're doing in the United States. This is data from the CDC right off their website. So about, only about a quarter of Americans in this survey, this was the National Health Interview Survey, and only a quarter of Americans are doing no leisure time physical activity. That's down from about a third 10 years ago. So that is certainly encouraging. However, only about half meet the current recommendations for two and a half hours of moderate activity or one hour and 15 minutes of vigorous activity. And very few meet the strength training recommendations. So about a quarter meet, the, meet those recommendations. So this is a slide that figures prominently in the guidelines, and I think it's worth spending a little time talking about this, the data set that this comes from. This is a widely quoted study, along with a study by more of the same uh, patients, patient subjects. These are six studies from the NCI cohort consortium, about 600,000 patients here followed for 14 years and they look at mortality. This is total mortality as a function of met hours per week. They do use Cox proportional hazards regression and you can see they've modified for age, sex, educational level, smoking, cancer, heart disease, alcohol, and BMI. And you can see this relationship that is runs throughout many studies like this. So this is a perfect example where if you go from being inactive or zero met hours per week, and you go to zero, this is the average of subjects who have some activity up to seven and a half met hours per week. So starting the, the guidelines would start here and go roughly through here, if you would. So we can see a big drop, about a 20% reduction in mortality by having some element of, of leisure time physical activity, in this case, moderate or vigorous. If you meet the guidelines, so seven and a half to 15 met hours per week, you get a significant increase in benefit here, reduction in mortality. Now the hazard ratio is about 0.3. And then more exercise, so two to three times, three to five times the recommendation, minimum recommendation, you see some additional benefit, but the curve is flattening. And so really getting patients to follow the guidelines gets them about 70% of the potential benefit according to the guidelines. So this is a great goal for people who are starting out, sorry, people who start out here or even here. Now you can see at the end here for subjects who did more than 75 med hours per week, there seems to be a hazard here, but this, you can see the error bars are very tall. There were very few subjects doing that. So this is not thought to be the case. So there's no significant evidence of um, hazard here with more exercise. So this was mentioned in the guidelines, but this study, so I wanted to talk about the Weekend Warrior study that Donovan et al. published in JAMA three years ago. They also looked at self-reported leisure time physical activity and they broke patient, uh, subjects into inactive, insufficiently active, so they weren't meeting the guidelines, but they were active. Weekend warriors meeting the guidelines in one or two sessions per week. And then the regularly active folks who were meeting the guidelines in three or more sessions per week. And interestingly, if you look at the table, there was really no significant difference in the active groups, so either insufficiently active, weekend warrior, or regularly active, which I thought was a bit surprising. To me, it's, it's reassuring that weekend warriors do derive benefit. They do better, 30% better in terms of mortality than the inactive group. 
but there was not a whole lot of difference between, there wasn't any difference, in fact, between the insufficiently active group and the weekend warriors. Again, some activity is beneficial, even if it doesn't meet the guidelines. So one of the reasons I got interested in doing this talk is that my first day in medical school, I was sitting in my first class and it's cardiovascular physiology and William Parlet Parmley came down from UCSF to give a lecture on cardiac mechanics. And he looked at us before the lecture started and he says, you can probably tell that I don't exercise regularly. He was a little bit, uh, I'll say real rotund and he said, it's true, I don't exercise. He said, I figured out that yes, you would lower your mortality if you exercise, but you would spend all of that time exercising. And I didn't believe it at the time, and I, but I never really looked into it until I did this presentation. So I wanna focus on that. Do you in fact only get back the time you spend exercising at the end? So there's a couple of studies. This is a very nice study from Taiwan, uh, uh, Wen et al. published in The Lancet in 2011. And they had 400,000 individuals who were participating in a standard medical screening program. And again, this is self-reported physical activity. So leisure time physical activity. And they actually, they did calculate met hours per week for these individuals and they broke them into five categories from inactive to very highly active at 25 Mets hours per week or more. Again, half were women, the follow-up was eight years. And again, we'll talk about the limitations of self-reported physical activity questionnaires later in the talk. Uh, this was again, a prospective cohort study. So this is what they found and it's not linear, but it's more linear than the data we looked at before. So you can see some activity lowered mortality about 14% and then lots of activity, again, 25 med hours a week or more, lowered mortality 35% in their population. And they again controlled for anything they could think of that would be related to mortality from alcohol to uh, labor time at work, sex, education, hypertension, diabetes, glucose, blood pressure. They also reported their data in terms of life years gained, which is what I want to focus on. So if you did low volume exercise, so you didn't meet the guidelines, but you were active, you had about two to 2.3 to 2.6 years in men and about three years in women in terms of, of life gained. And for those meeting the current guidelines, about four years in men and almost four years in women. More, also looking at the NCI data set, did the same sort of analysis. This is another very, this is very similar to the data we showed at the beginning. Just doesn't have quite, doesn't look at the high levels of activity that Aram did in his later analysis. But you can see about three to four life years gained doing from 10 to 20 med hours of activity for a week. So here's the guideline activity here and here in these two points. So three to four years. So here's a poor kitty who did, did, is not finding the gym to his or her liking, but uh, take heart kitty because if you do the calculations and let's say you do seven and a half med hours per week of exercise, you would spend over 30 years, let's say you do the minimum amount, 117,000 minutes, 1,950 hours, but you would, you, or 81 days. If you did the uh, five hours, what is five hours a week, well, week, you would spend 162 days or half a year exercising. So, um, and over 50 years, this is per year, so sorry, 30 years, and over 50 years, up to almost, a, not quite a year, three, what, three quarters of a year, something like that. But again, if you're saving three to four years, you have not spent nearly that much time exercising. So. I think Dr. Parmley wasn't, at that time at least, based on the data may well have been right, but based on the data that I can find, I think that it is very much worthwhile to exercise. You will gain more time at the end of your life, hopefully healthy time. So here's a gentleman who wants to start an exercise program and he's 
he maybe he's committed to exercising and he did drive past the store that sells sweatpants but I am concerned about the TV remote and his close proximity to the television here. So let's talk about how sedentary behavior and TV viewing time might moderate your benefits from exercise. This is a, a widely quoted paper by Eckeland et al. It's a meta-analysis involving about a million subjects from 16 different trials, as I remember. And they again looked at met hours per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity or leisure time physical activity, if you will. But many of these studies also had data on sedentary time and also TV viewing time. So if we look at this slide, they've broken, this is sitting time and it's broken down into more than eight hours, six to eight hours, four to six hours per day or less than four hours per day. And then four groups of leisure time physical activity from less than 2.5, I think, I can't quite read, maybe that's less than 7.5, and as much as 35.5. And you can see that sitting more than eight hours is actually a ha very much a hazard here in the inactive group and becomes less of a hazard and is not a significant hazard in the groups that exercise. So by exercising, if you have patients uh, who have a sedentary job, but by exercising, they may remove some of the hazard of sedentary activity by exercising a moderate degree or more. Uh, however, uh, TV viewing time is much less attenuated by exercise. I don't have an explanation for that as yet, but watching more than five hours of TV a day, you can see had a hazard. It was not quite a significant hazard here compared to uh, three to four hours a day, but it was compared to the very active subjects who did not watch television or watch very little television. So in TV time is not fully attenuated by, by exercise. This is another important study published. Uh, it's not mentioned in the guidelines, so it really didn't catch their attention in 2018, but this is data from the PURE trial. You've probably seen diet studies from the PURE trial over the last year, a couple of years in Lancet. But this is their exercise study. And the PURE trial looked at physical activity in 17 countries, many of them low and middle income. And they looked at total physical activity. They used the International Physical Activity Questionnaire, which I have reviewed. And it asked questions about job-related activity, walking to work, transportation, household work, house maintenance, as well as leisure time physical activity. So, we're going to look at a little different categories. So they broke the patients down, subjects down into less than 600 met minutes per week, uh, 600 to 3,000, and more than 3,000 total physical activity. And they looked at, again, about 130,000 individuals. They excluded the patient subjects without already had cardiovascular disease. And of course, anyone who didn't fit, fill out the physical questionnaire. And they did a couple of things. They looked at moderate versus low activity. They looked at high versus low activity and high activity versus moderate activity. So you can see in all the groups, there's a benefit. So the more total physical activity, the lower the mortality in this, in this cohort of, of subjects. So mortality in major cardiovascular disease in this slide, as well as major cardiovascular disease. And here is all cause mortality. So uh, a little bit of exercise is good uh, and more exercise is even better in their cohort. So hazard ratios of 0.8 and about 0.65. And when they broke that down into uh, income levels, so they looked at high and high, high income country subjects and those middle income countries that of the higher end of income in the middle income countries against versus the low income countries and the lower half income of the middle income countries. And you can see that total activity, physical activity, moderate and high led to a reduction here in mortality. There's a little more than a reduction in the high income countries. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure what that's about. It may well be related to the fact that they did not do as much leisure time physical activity in the low income countries, maybe that vigorous leisure time physical activity is a benefit. 
They did look at non-recreational physical activity here, and you can see even in non-recreational physical activity here, there's no significant difference in the two groups. And for leisure time physical activity, uh, recreational, there's, there's no apparent uh, benefit here in the low income countries, but they had very little leisure time physical activity. So I don't think that's uh, significant. Here's another trial that, uh, that was published in 2019 from Korea. And it really, st what struck me about this study is they looked at, unlike other studies that I ran across, they actually looked at subjects who had cardiovascular disease as well as subjects without cardiovascular disease. So if you, these are 400,000 uh, subjects, mean age 60 years, again, a, a self-reported physical activity. This was a uh, prospective cohort. 30% um, of them had cardiovascular disease. There was really no significant difference in the amount of activity between those with and without cardiovascular disease, at least clinically significant to me. It may have been statistically significant. And again, about half of the subjects did not meet the current guidelines or get up to even 500 minutes per week of activity. And they followed them for uh, six years. And we can see here the relative risk of mortality in blue, the subject without cardiovascular disease, and relatively flat. So if you did up to the guidelines of about 500 minutes per week, you really got 90% of the benefit in terms of mortality reduction for exercise. And in the subjects with cardiovascular disease, uh, you see a bigger drop here going from getting up to 1,000 to 1,500 met minutes per week. And it was pointed out by the reviewers as well as the authors here, Jiang and others, that you had basically, if you were had cardiovascular disease, and most of them had ischemic disease, some had heart failure, some had history of stroke, there was no significant difference between the mortality and the cardiovascular disease subjects who did a lot of exercise and these subjects without cardiovascular disease here, even at baseline, you can see those that didn't exercise versus those who um, exercised at a high degree and had cardiovascular disease. So again, some data that uh, lots of exercise with patients with cardiovascular diseases may be beneficial. Again, one study though. Um, okay. So let's, uh, I wanna, my own bias is again, that vigorous activity may be better than moderate activity. And I think uh, I'm probably, I may well be wrong. Uh, and if it's looking at the data we've shown so far, even a small amount of activity seems to benefit you in terms of mortality reduction. Uh, but, but I did find some evidence that vigorous activity does add additional benefits. So this is again from the WIN data from Taiwan. And they looked at subjects uh, moderate versus vigorous leisure time physical activity. So if you look at the hazard ratio for mortality in those 60 and above, for example, there were 21,000 subjects. By and large, they were younger here, but um, so uh, these were all the subjects who did moderate or vigorous physical activity, leisure time physical activity. The, more, the uh, reduction here in uh, mortality doing only moderate activity, by METS was about 28%, and then about 57% if you also did some vigorous activity as well. So there seemed to be additional benefit here to doing vigorous activity in their data set. And a similar finding, this is data from the Health Survey for England and the Scottish Health Survey. We saw their data also in the uh, uh, Weekend Warrior data set. I forgot to mention that. Um, but here also looking at uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity. So these were all subjects who did moderate or vigorous physical activity. Uh, these are the subjects with relative risk of one who just did moderate activity and doing some vigorous activity did have additional benefit in terms of mortality reduction in their data set. And very similar findings here in an Australian study from the 45 and up cohort study in New South Wales, Australia, a couple hundred thousand individuals. And again, if you did some vigorous physical activity, 
uh, so six or more Mets, there was about a 10% additional reduction in mortality in their data set. So we've looked so far at large cohort studies that involved self-reported physical activity. Now self-reported physical activity is not ideal. There are biases which have been demonstrated that tend to overestimate leisure time physical activity. Most of the studies we've looked at with the exception of the PURE trial did not look at uh, occupational physical activity, transportation physical activity. So there's not good, they don't provide data on total and light physical activity. They may underestimate sedentary time. And therefore, the overall may underestimate the relationship between physical activity and mortality due to imprecise measurement of activity. And so the new guidelines, you'll see there's, they said there's insufficient evidence available to determine whether a relationship exists between step counts per day and all cause and cardiovascular disease mortality and they're very interested in having more data from accelerometers that can actually measure total physical activity. And since the guidelines have been published, we do have some data. Here's another cartoon from Randy Glassbergen. So 21 minutes a week wiggling in and out of my pantyhose does count. That might be considered light physical activity. And we're going to get some data now on light physical activity from these accelerometer trials. Uh, this was a study that I remember reading about in the newspaper at the time. This is from the Women's Health Study, uh, uh, I am Lee et al. in circulation in 2018. And this would look at the Women's Health Group. They had 17,000 subjects. They sent them accelerometers and they were asked them to wear them 15 hours a day. I think on average they uh, the women who used them wore them somewhere between 10 and 14 hours per day. The mean age was 72, so the group on average was older. And so they were able to look using accelerometers at both light, moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity and sedentary behavior as well. So again, I'm sorry the slide is uh, pretty bunched up here, but they again, they had two models. They model one adjusted for age and wear time Model two, again, adjusted for multiple variables, including diet, history of family history of MI, uh, history of cardiovascular disease, cancer, et cetera. Um, and then when they analyzed uh, the moderate, vigorous, and light physical activity, they mutually adjusted for the other. So that's important to point out. So if we look at total counts per day, so this is total activity, and we look at mortality here, you can see that in the two models, there is clearly a, well, very linear uh, in the four quartiles of activity. That's how this was done. You can see that there's a hazard ratio of 0.4. So there's 60% less mortality in the most active group of women here. And one of the arguments they make for the, the really dramatic reduction in mortality is that with the accelerometer, maybe they're doing a better job detecting total activity than from the self-reported questionnaires. Again, this is not a large study and I think more data is needed, much more data is needed. But you see a dramatic reduction in mortality here in the most active group. There is seemingly a graded reduction here. Now light physical activity shown here, there was, after controlling from moderate to vigorous activity, there was no signal from light physical activity using the accelerometer. Um, that was not true of moderate to vigorous physical activity. The benefit we see in total activity seemed to have been the result of moderate to vigorous physical activity as measured by the accelerometer. And then again, controlling for physical activity here, there was no really no significant uh, impact of sedentary uh, time on mortality in their study. Now, Ekeland, again, published last year, did a meta-analysis of a number of accelerometer studies. And so eight studies, there was about 37, 6,000 subjects. A majority were women, uh, follow-up was about six years. And again, I'm not, an ex I'm not a statistician, and so someone can help, someone can chime in at the end and tell me what a spline model is. But basically, uh, if you look at total physical activity, 
you can see a very linear relationship here. So we have a hazard a relative risk of one for mortality here is about an activity of about 150 counts per minute during the day. And you can see this very linear relationship down to about 300. So the more activity, the lower the mortality. And again, look at the point four. Again, uh, the authors here, as well as the reviewers, commented on this finding pretty dramatic decrease hazard ratio of show for mortality here. And he also looked at light physical activity and did see a signal. There was a, in this, in this meta-analysis with twice as many subjects, you do see a linear relationship between light physical activity and mortality in that particular study. So maybe, maybe that lady was right uh, with her pantyhose exercise. Let's see, sedentary time here, is it, uh, let's see, you know, yeah, sedentary hours per day. There was a signal, pretty small signal until about nine hours. So more than nine hours a day of sedentary time. Again, that, that's that been seen in other studies. So nine hours is uh, probably important to avoid sedentary activity of around nine hours. And finally, uh, one other study from NHANE, so the National Health and Nutrition Survey, they did the same sort of cohort study where they mailed uh, they mailed out accelerometers of those subjects who use the accelerometers. They looked at steps per day and mortality. And you can see this nice curve that very much mirrored what we saw with moderate to vigorous physical activity in the uh, self-reported leisure activity cohorts. And so about 8,000 steps per day gets you most of the mortality benefit in this data set. So again, this is important because many of our patients have Fitbits and other Garmin and other brands of uh, iPhones, whatever. And you can see about 8,000 steps a day would get them more, get them the benefit that you're looking for. Again, I think we need more data using accelerometers. I don't think we have enough data as yet. So let's switch gears a little bit. No, that's not me in, in college. That's Arnold Schwarzenegger. If you've never seen the documentary Pumping Iron, I highly recommend it. If you're social distancing at home, pull it out. It's probably 30 years old now, but it, it's, uh, it's quite an amazing uh, documentary about Arnold's workouts when he was Mr. Universe. Um, and over here, there's the other issue of resistance training. We have to train ourselves to avoid foods that are not good for us. I shouldn't mention the fact that my wife brought home pizza last night, but I did exercise two days ago, so hopefully I'm okay. All right, we talked about improvement in uh, certain uh, aspects were coming from strength training. So bone health, physical function, lowered risk of falls. I found one study which looked at uh, strength promoting exercises and mortality. And this is, this is again from the Health Survey for England and the Scottish Health Survey data. And what they did, they looked at uh, their cohort, and it's again prospective cohort. This is self-reported uh, strength training. They looked at none, and this is a hazard ratio of mortality, okay. Uh, none, gym-based strength training twice a week, doing your own body weight training twice a week or doing a combination. And you can see there was a signal here that there was a reduction in mortality in subjects who did strength training. And again, this is one study and I'd like to see a lot more data, but I would certainly say we do have data, at least according to the guidelines, that strength training improves physical function and bone health. I'm not convinced yet about mortality at this time. B here uh, was cardiovascular disease mortality, and then C here was cancer mortality. And again, maybe a little bit of a signal here that uh, lots of string training is a benefit. The PURE trial investigators in, the, uh, in their 17 countries, they actually looked at grip strength at baseline. And so everyone had, had grip strength measured, and they published this page for this year, uh, Salim Youssef uh, was, of course, uh, I think the lead author in that uh, study. They looked at physical activity, but we've already reviewed that in the other paper. But this is the grip strength data. Uh, look at the relationship between grip strength and mortality here. And so if you have 
very poor grip strength. You had a 60% increase in mortality. I'm assuming they're measuring frailty here, uh, fitness and frailty, but I was just struck by this. And again, I don't know what that says about strength training because again, these may be folks who are, would, not be, would not be able to strength train potentially. Now we talk about counseling. Uh, this is one way to counsel your patients. Uh, you can remind them about the mortality benefit. I would probably do it in a little bit different way myself, uh, but this is a busy doctor. You can see he's, he's scratching out his prescription and he's heading for the door. But again, I think uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how we can counsel our patients and do a little bit better job. And there are a couple of publications which I referenced here which I think really are not, they don't go too much into behavioral counseling as a science, which I get lost on, but it's just sort of bread and butter ideas about helping your patients exercise more. And we'll start with the table, um, making physical activity a vital sign. And the recommendation was to have the medical assistant actually take, uh, ask the patients if they're exercising. If so, note it. Uh, and know what they're doing as part, as part of the vital signs. Now I do this routinely myself. So the healthcare professional, I always ask every patient if they're exercising, if so, what they're doing, how much they're doing, and so that I can encourage them to do more, okay? So um, again, part two here, ask them what type, how many minutes and how often. And again, I do that routinely myself. We could, and I could envision the clinic staff doing that as well. Um, I always remind my patients about the benefits of exercise. I think I've learned more from doing this talk. I can talk about cancer reduction, uh, some of the specific cancers, uh, falls. I've always mentioned falls and physical conditioning to my older patients. We typically do come up with a prescription. So uh, we talk about how much time to spend. What do they want to do? We'll talk about that in a second, but what do they want to do? What activity do they see themselves doing? And then we'll, talk, we'll come up with a prescription and I'll write it down for them on their patient instructions. So we talked about walking 30 minutes, three times a week for a total of 90 minutes a week. And you can review the benefits of exercise with them. You can show them the curves. I'm gonna provide a handout, which I'm gonna show you in a second that gives, can give you and patients ideas about exercises they can do to meet the guidelines. So write a prescription, provide the handout, and maybe check a circle the exercise on the handout that you've agreed to, to do. You can encourage uh, using apps or pedometers. You, they have a cell phone. Many cell phones have apps. Activity Tracker is one that I use for steps per day. Um, there are probably websites. I couldn't find a website uh, that specifically helped subjects monitor, but I would say apps on the phone uh, some of my subjects or patients are using Noom, which is both diet and exercise, but just for activity tracking, I think uh, activity tracker would be a reasonable choice for them. And then record keeping. I ask the patients to keep track of what they're doing and then call back and talk to the nurses or eat care us with their activity level. And at every visit, um, it's important to ask them how they're doing on their exercise program. And if they're not doing well, just encourage them in the next visit. I do that a lot because as you know, it's hard to get people to exercise. I just encourage them to get going if they're, if they're not able to get started. Now the other paper here, and I think this is uh, the layer paper, um, barriers. So if they're not exercising, assess barriers. So I've started to do this after uh, researching this, uh, doing this talk. So what are the barriers and is there anything you know, we can do to help you with those barriers? What is it? Sometimes I'll say, I have no place to exercise. There are too many hills around my house. I encourage them to drive and walk in the park or get, get away from the hills to start out. Um, important that the patient should set the goals. And so I've not always been good about that. I usually give recommendations. So I've started to do that. What would you like to do? What kind of exercise makes sense to you? And then help them set the goals they should be involved in setting the goal. And again, self-monitoring, have them write it down, keep a log, uh, 
use activity tracker, watch their, their steps per day, et cetera, it would be very important. And then ask them, I have patients who just routinely, many of them engineers, and they show me their activity tracker every time they come to clinic. So those are some ideas, but I just think bringing it up at every visit just takes a couple of minutes, and I think it would be worthwhile. So this is the compendium of physical activities. This is, this is where all the met, uh, mets of different activities are kept on the web. So the compendiums of physical, physical activities. My favorite one was walking to and from the outhouse is 2.5 mets. So for those of you living in Redmond and Woodenville and uh, Mercer Island, you might need to know that. But let's see, this is what I used then to make this handout. So I'm going to make it into a handout. This is obvious a slide, but I took the data from Aram and I, I looked at the different cut points, A, B, C, and D, and then different levels of exercise, met hours per week. And then I put in A, B, C, and D some different programs that would get you to that level of activity. So if, if you're at B and you want to get to D, you have some activities. You're running six miles an hour, two and a half to four hours a week. Vigorous cycling, which I know many of you do, two and a half to four hours per week gets you to, to D. For those uh, folks who aren't active, A, uh, walking one to two hours a week, uh, water aerobics one hour per week, going to curbs one to two hours per week, playing doubles tennis, leisure cycling for one hour per week will get you to A and et cetera, et cetera. For me, I think uh, pushing, uh, for those of us who play golf, uh, golf with pushing a cart about four hours per week will get, so one round of golf, a vigorous sort of round of golf theoretically would get you to point C. Uh, singles tennis for two to three hours. Vigorous circuit training, which uh, I like to do two to three hours per week would get you to C. And then in between here for B. And then what I've also done is I commissioned my trainer to uh, come up with an uh, exercise program for our patients. So he's done that. And I, again, he sent it to me in a form that was not easy for me to put on a slide, but I'm giving you an example. I asked him to give us a program for, for patients who are healthy under 65, healthy over 65, and frail. And he did that for me. And he did uh, joint mobilization exercises with explanations. He did uh, flexibility, uh, sorry, uh, stretching or flexibility. And then he also did resistance training. So here's an example for the adults over 65. I think there are 10 exercises they can do at home. And you can see Romanian deadlift and he explains how to do it, but he also put a YouTube video was attached to it. And so they can click on the YouTube video, see how it's done by a fitness trainer and then do it at home. So, and that's a resource I will somehow make available and if I get approval, I can put it on the cardiology website. So I think I'm out of time just about. And so uh, the summary slide. So uh, this is really a pep talk about exercise, that exercise even in small doses uh, helps our patients. And I'm hoping to provide some tools to help you do that. Um, we've talked about counseling to help hopefully make us all a little bit better at getting our, our, our patients to exercise. Um, I think there is some data that vigorous exercise is better than moderate exercise. I don't think it's conclusive. I know that I do vigorous exercise as part of my routine. Uh, I, would still rec I still recommend it to my patients who are able to do vigorous exercise. I'm still very interested in high intensity interval training, which I do, but I always keep my heart rate at less than 80% of my maximum. And so that's something I would sort of like to involve, it may perhaps get involved in doing a study uh, at, the, at Northwest one day, looking at this and subjects to see if we can improve their health. Uh, resistance training we talked about, I don't have a lot of good data for you. I just not have time, but avoiding frailty is really my focus in our population. Uh, physical uh, activity counseling, and then I'll make the exercise program available. So I think I will stop there and take any questions.